You're listening to Building the Broncos with Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler, Broncos country's leading draft and scouting analysts. Get on over to milehighhuddle.com to sound off on all things Broncos. Hello there, Broncos country, and it is once again time for another episode of Building the Broncos. I am your host, Carl Dummler, and with me as always, I have my co-host and good friend, Mr. Nick Kendall, and we are joined by a great guest, Matt Valdovinos. Joining us here, he's uh, he's one of the part of the mob boss. We've got that going on with the Broncos, so I want to say thank you for joining us here, Matt. And uh, make sure to give us a, a good review with uh, with all the other mob bosses in Denver. But gentlemen, how's it going this evening? Hey, it's Monday. It's uh, Broncos, a little bit of slow day for the, the legal tampering. But Matt's joining us, a, a Redskins fan, and Redskins have been making some noise with Landon Collins, and apparently they're still in on C.J. Mosley. So they're, I mean. The, the Washington Crimson Tide. I mean, as of right now, there's, I think, six expected starters to be um, Alabama players. So might as well go for seven. If they sign, if they re-sign Ha-Ha Clint Dix, it'll be seven. But, I mean, I'm, you know, guys, I'm stoked. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm excited. It was a gorgeous day today. Um, a little bit of warm weather up here in Pennsylvania, finally. So um, it's been good. I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, I've been on the podcast before with Matt, and I think Dalton's off the grid for the next month. Mm-hmm. So excited to have you on here. We can talk a little bit of smack about him while he's uh, not here to defend himself because that's what honorable people do. Exactly. But, <laughs> but no, yeah, excited free agency. That's kind of all the buzz right now, but we're going to dial it back. This is a, a draft-focused podcast, so we're going to be talking about off-ball linebackers today. So that'll be great. So, Matt, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and kind of give our listeners a chance to know where they can find you, where they can listen to your your content, and and know a little bit more about, uh, I mean, we're, we're always trying to increase everybody's draft and football knowledge, and uh, you are a good one for them to follow. So where can they find you? Um, you can follow me on Twitter at MV Scouting. Give me all of the you know hot takes, the cold takes. Let me know what you think of my takes. Um, I love the conversation, the interaction. That's my favorite thing about it. Um, if if you think something I said is stupid, please tell me and let me know why. Um, other than that, you can find my writing. I've written in a couple places. Uh, the two main ones right now are Blue Chip Scouting. Uh, Dalton and I have a podcast over there. We have a, the Blue Chip Scouting podcast where we're our co-host talk about everything NFL draft, just NFL in general. Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, I know you guys here have essentially, you know, a Broncos thing going on, obviously, both Broncos fans and is building the Broncos over there. We're a little more general. He's a red or a Cowboys fan. I'm a Redskins fan. So we do have a little division argument going there now and again, but typically it's just a real broad sense of everything. And then uh, all of my draft work you can find on um, at bluechipscouting.com. Um, so you can go there, just click on blog and I'm, you know, one of the few consistent authors on there. And I got to say, I got to give you credit. I was listening to the Blue Chip Scouting Podcast. must have been last week, two weeks ago. But your take on a bowl, a cereal bowl of milk, but instead of cereal, putting Oreos in it changed my life. I think that I'm trying to lose some weight for the wedding. I don't know if that's going to happen after that. <laughs> Did you try because of that? It's so good. I, it's, I'm waiting for the right time, um, probably when the fiance is not here so she can't give me the look. I'm like, <laughs> hey, what are you doing to your arteries? But I think it's going to have to happen at some point because it just sounds amazing. And I might need to find a bigger spoon. But yeah, I, I, I'm about it. It's it's excellent. It's definitely one thing I would recommend. It, it, it's hard to kind of get a pack of Oreos and not want to eat the whole thing. Typically, I stick to six at a time, and yeah. that's kind of like my limit. So I'll throw six in, put the pack of Oreos away, and just go from there. I do the same, but with six beers. So ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Well, make sure to, to head on over and, and find Nick and I both on Twitter as well. You can find Nick at Nick Kindle MHH and myself at Carl Dunler MHH. And we also want to make sure that you follow the podcast Twitter account at BTB Football Pod. And make sure you subscribe to our show and leave us a rating as we value your input on our show. You can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and even that of YouTube. Also, make sure you head over to Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of 24-7 Sports and the C- CBS Sports Digital, to find hours in our co-writers' articles and all things pertaining to your Denver Broncos. This podcast is powered by Overtime Media. Well, gentlemen, before we get into the, the draft conversation... I thought we'd maybe talk a little bit about just the, the Broncos linebackers and what they have already here. And I mean, this is one of the, I think going to be one of the biggest groups that can really change from top to bottom over the next two years for the Broncos with Fangio in, in place and what he asks his linebackers to do. But I guess, especially uh, just turning it over to you, Matt, 
What are your thoughts on kind of the Broncos players with Todd Davis, Josie Jewell, Joe Jones, uh, Keyshawn Bieria, and, and AJ Johnson? Are any of those guys really any kind of good fit with Fangio? Do um, I even recognize for you? <laughs> I'm well, sure that some of these guys, yeah, Keyshawn Bieria, eh, Joe Jones, eh, maybe. It's not. So the biggest thing that I noticed is thinking about, like going back to obviously when the Broncos won the Super Bowl, um, that linebacker can. You know, that room was excellent with guys like Brandon Marshall. And I think Davis was still there. Um, they had Danny Trevathan. Danny Trevathan was the other one across from him. Um, but, you know, the, that linebacker group in total, I mean, that entire defense was, you know, phenomenal and arguably, you know, a top 10 defense ever. But it, it's definitely kind of crazy to see the, the names that just aren't there anymore. And so, you know, with guys and Josie Jewell, I, I know more so from, you know, watching the tape at Iowa, watching, you know, him play. But and, and I liked him coming out. Uh, it's just there's not a lot of star power is the problem. And so I think that that's kind of something you want to look for. Unfortunately, this this class that we're talking about isn't great. I think it's kind of, it's extremely top heavy um, into like the top four guys. And then a lot of it's just mm, question marks afterwards. Um but with a guy like Vic Fangio, they can make it work. We saw it with the Bears this past year. Um, obviously, having a guy like Roquan Smith makes it easy. But at the end of the day, I think worst case scenario, the Broncos will bring in someone in, in that you know early day two, mid day two kind of round or um, time. And I think Vic Fangio has the ability to to take a talent and, and make him into an every down, very capable starting linebacker. Um, so guys like Jewel and Davis can get the job done with Fangio, but I think it would be, you know, in the best interest to bring in a little more talent. Yeah. I, I was thinking of uh, when he was with the 49ers and they had Chris Borland, he was not exactly the most athletic guy, but he, he still made it work because he was a very instinctual guy. And, and that's, that's part of what makes it work there with, with Fangio. But I mean, even there, you're still looking for that upgrade of that more athletic traits that, that, somebody could bring. And I just, right now, I guess my big thing is I don't know that the Broncos are going to be able to fix this whole group in one off season. Cause like you said, the, the draft, I mean, there's, there's players, but there's a lot of rawness to a lot of these players. So how much production are you going to get year one? If you don't get one of the top guys and then two, I mean, free agency, we've already seen Quan Alexander getting what? 13.5 million a year. The highest and, paid linebacker yeah. of all time. <laughs> for for a day or two. Yeah. For, <laughs> Until CJ Mosley hmm. takes like 16, 17 million. And and so the market's just getting out of control. But I mean, again, it's gonna be hard to to fully fix this position in just one year. Yep, that's that's true. And the thing for me is like in the three four base, when you got Todd Davis and Josie Jewell, you're probably gonna be okay against the run. I mean, Josie Jewell sometimes struggles against getting off blocks. He's more of an instinctual run funneler type. And Davis, but actually pretty good against getting off blocks and getting down into that gap and crashing down there. But as far as you know, linebackers that you want out there for sub package, you know, guys that can cover in space, guys that can play laterally, you know, guys that can maybe even turn their back to the line of scrimmage sometimes. Yikes. It is really just not a good a good spot to be in right now for the Broncos and something that Vic Fangio has really emphasized for his linebackers is speed and coverage ability. And man, I just, I do not see it right now. Todd Davis. No, Josie Jewell. I know pro football focus for some reason loved his coverage ability. I don't know. It was probably that Iowa scheme that kind of masked and it was everybody being better than the original, you know, by themselves, you know, the sum was better than the, the individual parts. But other than that, not great. Keyshawn Bieria, I mean, six round pick, Probably he's a guy that maybe won't even make the roster next year. AJ Johnson, another thumper type. So they need speed and they need coverage ability bad. But luckily they got Vic Fangio. Uh, Got a tweet pulled up here from Brett Coleman. Vic Fangio might be one of the greatest linebacking coaches of all time. And it's not close. He's had linebackers. He's had 36 Pro Bowl appearances for linebackers under him. 23 first team All-Pro awards and Hall of Famers such as Mills, Jackson, Green, Lewis, Suggs, Willis and Mack, and I guess with uh, coming to the Broncos now, you can add Von Miller to that. That's including edge rushes as well, but still, that's pretty incredible. So pretty excited to see what Bill Collar does. I mean, even if the Broncos don't go linebacker early, they bring in somebody in free agency. If there's anybody that's got an eye for the talent, it's Dick Fangio. I mean, he he knows how to spot, develop, and create monsters at the linebacking position. 
Yeah, and the one thing with all of those, you know, the the players that are pulled up, Green, uh, specifically like Lewis Suggs, Willis Mack, is all of them came out of school talented. So, you know, a lot of them, Patrick Willis specifically, you know, Terrell Suggs, Cleo Mack, all were top 10 picks, um, if I'm remembering correctly. I think Ray Lewis was like a low first round pick or a late first. Um, You still have to give him the talent. So he may be this phenomenal coach, but you can only go so far with the players you're given. So I definitely think that, giving him players um, with high ceilings, kind of like the Bears did last year with Roquan before, you know, obviously they didn't expect him to be gone after a year. But, you know, giving Fangio someone to run the defense is definitely something I think that the Broncos should be looking for in the priority because you have the talent to get after the quarterback on that defensive line. Um, and you have a little bit of talent in the secondary. Uh, obviously, a lot of the guys are leaving Chris Harris, Darian Stewart, but – Still, just overall, I think Fangio wants to run kind of what he did with the Bears. He wants to be a defensive-minded team. You know, that's what the Broncos were known for for the past couple of years anyways. So I definitely think that getting him the talent is the most important thing. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, like you said, Matt, it's you, you got to pay for the talent. You got to mm-hmm. go and, and put the, the resources towards what you need. And Fangio has always said, I, I need those linebackers. I need them to be quality players and and – it has shown by the draft qualities that they are draft money that they've put into, to these kind of players. And so, yeah, it really wouldn't surprise me to see the Broncos. If, I mean, I don't think Devin white's going to be there at 10, but I, I could see even Devin Bush there at 10, especially after the combine that he had. And we're going to talk about these guys a little bit more as we get into this, but uh, I mean, having that kind of athleticism added to the team, I mean, after using a eighth overall pick on Roquan Smith this last week, last year, it definitely makes a lot of sense for them to to use something pretty high here for the Broncos to to really give Fangio what he wants. Yeah, and just you know, we had um, Nick Farabaugh and Andre Simone on the earlier podcast. Uh, Carl hosted and talking about in today's NFL, you can't have a complete liability and coverage out there at linebacker, and because teams are going to scheme that open. I mean, Broncos, we saw that time and time again. Todd Davis in the slot against a wide receiver. RIP game over. So got to have linebackers that can do, I mean, I'll even give up a little bit of run support for coverage ability these days, but you gotta, gotta try to find some linebackers that can play all three down sub base, all that jazz. And right now I don't see anybody on the Broncos that can do that. Uh, I'm not very high on this linebacker class in general. I don't have any linebackers in my top. I don't have any inside linebackers, off ball linebackers um, in my top 20 players. But one thing that I think they are actually, you know, they do well better than most classes is there are a number of guys who I feel comfortable in coverage and and maybe it's just because the game's evolving. That's how they're learning to play now. But there are a number of guys in this class specifically at the top, um, you know, three, four, five of the top eight guys, I feel comfortable putting in coverage at the next level. And I think that's actually where their game is strong. Absolutely. Coverage is something they're going to look for. And that this has a class with some guys that can do that. So uh, before we get into those guys, we're going to look at some of these top of these, the top of the class here. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break again. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, and we're back. And, I mean, you got to start off talking this linebacking class with a guy that's been pretty pretty well hyped up all season. You got – he's been – you know, some people think he might be the best linebacker in the past few seasons. There's some debate. You know, there's Roquan truthers. There's other people. But I, I'm a big fan of him. We'll see if he makes it to 10. But Devin White from Louisiana State, linebacker, you know, six foot – a monster athlete. I mean, I, I think he might have set the record for the fastest 40 time ever run by a, an off ball linebacker. 99th percentile. I mean, he's either tied or he set the record. So, absolute freak. And, Matt, I'm curious about your thoughts on this linebacker who I think potentially maybe a guy that you'd hoped at one point maybe would fall to 15 to the skins, but probably not going to happen now. I think he's probably going to go as high as five. Yeah, I'm definitely, I mean, I'm a fan. Uh, I'm also an LSU you know, guy, uh, my mom and her dad grew up in Louisiana. So they grew up big LSU guys or LSU fans. So Devin White's definitely been someone that I've been a fan of for a while. I do have some questions as to the five is really high for me. And, and I know he might go that high. Um, and I'm definitely a Roquan truther in terms of the argument as to who the best linebacker prospect is if we're comparing the two of them. But I mean, in terms of upside, White might have the edge in just pure athletic ability um, the ability to see the ball and go after the ball, it's, it's unmatched. His, his ability to find the ball and then his ability to get there as soon as, as quick as he does is insane for a guy who weighs 240 pounds. 
And it's really insane because LSU doesn't require a lot from its linebackers the way they run. It's a very simple scheme, and you kind of see it cover up some of his weaknesses. So I, I think his translation into the NFL will be a little difficult, and I think he will have his struggles. But in terms of upside, I, I don't know if there's a linebacker in recent memory that matches him. Devin White is absolutely phenomenal. And in terms of ceiling, I think he could even go to four if the Raiders um, are still there. If they don't move up for a quarterback or if they don't take a quarterback, I wouldn't be surprised to see them take White. He seems like a guy that Mike Mayock would love. He seems like a, a guy that, that John Gruden would get, you know, a real grinder. And so I definitely think that Devin White's ceiling is all the way up to four. I don't expect him to make it out of the top ten. But if the Broncos can pull this off, it's an excellent fit for their team. I think with the three four, the way the speed that you have to be, and being you know a Redskins fan, I do understand what it's like for the three four, what they require from your, their linebackers. And so I think White really does well with his ability to penetrate the gaps. And with guys like Bradley Chubb and Von Miller, you don't have to worry about you know the keys as often because you do have the players that kind of force the wash that force the cutbacks. And that's where Devin White's really going to make some noise. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing, you know, just kind of taking, we do this every year, but taking what the Patriots did in the Super Bowl, what Dante Hightower did as an a gap Mm -hmm. blitzer is something that I think is highly translatable for Devin White. He doesn't always do the best job finishing. You know, he kind of can arrive out of control, but his ability to just be an explosive player through that a gap, I think can completely just deteriorate teams blocking schemes. I mean, we saw what Vic Fangio did when the, when the bears played the Rams in Chicago and they did that a lot. They kind of, you know, hid those blitzes, use some coffee house stunts and really just messed with the, the Rams entire flow. And man, if I, I'm really excited, I would be really excited about that upside with the blitzer up the middle. Now you're not going to use it all the time, but to have that in your back pocket to, you know, kind of hide that pressure, maybe have a delayed one, maybe off of a stunt or running behind Von Miller who crashes in. I mean, there's so many different things you can do with create pressure. And when you got a guy that arrives with as much power and speed and covers ground like Devin white coming downhill, man, that's absolutely just a, an ace in the hole and something I, I don't think I have valued enough in linebackers previously, but with these schemes kind of changing a little bit, getting a little bit more with disguising the pressure instead of totally relying on those guys up front and then dropping everybody else back, that ability as a blitzer is very important to me and something that really makes Devin White stand out. He had uh, 33 quarterback pressures this last year. Wow, that's incredible for an yeah. off-ball linebacker from the second level. Mm-hmm. And and that's what I was talking about LSU's. LSU's defense is essentially the linebackers are almost playing a one gap scheme, which you rarely hear linebackers do. Um, you know, a, a typical defense will ask the linebackers to read the guards or the center um, or the tackles if they're, you know, really far off. Um, but typically you're reading the guards, you're seeing if they're down blocking, if they're pulling, and then you react to that if it's a pass set. Um, LSU does a lot of of pressures where, okay, this is your gap. Now you can either shoot it or you can sit. And it depends on if you're playing strong side, weak side, or, you know, what you read before the play happens is, but that's kind of where it covered the deficiencies. What I talked about a little bit earlier is that his ability to, um, as soon as he sees the play, if that's his read, he shoots the gap. And whether it's a sack or a tackle for loss, we saw it all over his plays, um, you know, highlight after highlight. And it's what he did at LSU. And it's why he's going to be a top 10 pick. Yeah. I am just all about this. I'd be all about him at 10. You know, if the Broncos didn't have a linebacker need, I, like I've been saying, even even if they do have a, or not a linebacker need, a quarterback need, I've been saying Devin White or Ed Oliver, one of those two for this Broncos defensive front seven. Good night. I mean, it's just good. Yeah, it takes terrifying. it to a whole new level. Yeah. Ed Oliver next oh. to Von Miller's like a nightmare. <laughs> and, and Bradley Chubb. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like unfair. Oh. Like who do you block? But th- those are the guys, Devin White's the other one. And it's not just, you know, the blitzing is something that I really don't think I, I valued enough previously. Mm-hmm. And that's what the three, four defense is big, but also he's just so smooth in coverage. I mean, he can play anywhere. He can cover big ground. Those instincts are concerning, but I will, and he plays a little bit of reckless at time as well, but I will surrender that consistency in that regard. I know it's scary for a linebacker and you know, you want guys to do their job, Bill Belichick style, but if you can cover like he can and blitz like he can and move like he can, I have no problem using, using a top 10 pick on him in this Vic Fangio defensive scheme. Yeah. And I think Vic Fangio is probably the one thing where I'd be, where, where Devin White gets picked. And I'm like, that's absolutely a top 10 pick. And it's an excellent one because of who he is, because we know what he can do with linebackers. So having a guy with the talent of Devin White really is something special versus a team, maybe like the Buccaneers. Um, they've also been able to, 
develop linebackers. That's where you kind of see the fit. But then teams who kind of have struggled, you know, teams like the Raiders who don't have excellent linebacker play, a team like the Jets where it's just like, okay, what, you know, you have Devin White, you have this talent, but what can you do with it? Yeah, it's it's all about that scary P word, potential. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, we were talking in the last podcast with some guys about last year, so many of the guys that were picked went to perfect situations where like Van Der Esch, I didn't expect him to have that kind of impact year one, but there in, in, in Dallas with that defensive coordinator, I mean, that, that was a very, very good fit. Roquan going to, to Chicago working with Fangio. I mean, that makes a ton, a ton of sense. Uh, Leonard there and in, in with the Colts. I mean, he was able to have a great season, but it was also a scheme that fit him very, mm-hmm. very well. And, and so, I mean, so much of what happens in the draft, it's really just not about the talent, but it's also about how well they can fit with what the team is going to need. Uh, too often we get so focused on the talent and forget about the fit. Yeah. And me and Nick actually talked about that a little earlier today. Um, you know, looking at players who are busts, they got picked in the first round for a reason. They have that potential. They have that talent. Um, whether or not a player succeeds, you know, at least in my eyes, is 50% on the player and 50% on the coaching and, and the situation they're put in. Uh, and the best example is a guy like David Carr and a guy like Jamarcus Russell. Jamarcus Russell was picked first overall, had all the talent in the world, but, you know, failed to live up to it because of the player he was. He didn't work very hard. Um, you know, there was stories of him lying about watching tape, just not caring, ballooning up to like 300 pounds in the offseason, you know, things like that, where he's just not, he doesn't care. And then a guy like David Carr, who had the talent in the world, who worked hard, who watched film, but the Texans put him in such a terrible situation where he, he was sacked, you know, I think it was like, what the single season record for a quarterback getting sacked. He said it in his rookie year or his second year, you can't expect a quarterback to succeed like that. And, and it's not just quarterback, it's every position. The, the teams need to put the players in a position to succeed as well as the player having to want that drive, have that, you know, to have that fire burning. Yeah. He, he's always that one player. I wonder if he went to a better situation, what kind of career he could have had. But I mean, that that's a whole nother conversation. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're trying to talk linebackers. We mm-hmm. could get off on that rabbit trail a lot on a lot of different players, but uh, looking at another Devin here, Devin Bush, Here's another guy. I mean, if Devin White didn't go out and have an historical combine running that that four four two, Devin Bush would be absolutely talked about like crazy for running a four four three, and coming in pretty good size. He was only what three pounds lighter than Devin White, only an inch shorter, and and showed well. He's he's got good production there, obviously in college with with Michigan for three years. What what do you? What do you like here about Devin Bush, even especially compared to like that of Devin White? Well, I think in terms of just readiness to play at the next level, um, if I'm taking any linebacker in this class to plug into any defense and just have him play inside linebacker um, and go make every read, go do everything I need him to do, it's Devin Bush. He's so far ahead, and I think he's a little limited because I understand they ran similar 40s, but just on tape, you can tell the kind of athlete White is. White is versus Bush. Um, Bush is faster more so than quick. Um, White is really, really quick and real twitchy along with his long speed. And it shows. But Bush's ability in between the tackles to make the read and, and to really just be a thumper, I think is unmatched in the class. And I think that's what he does best. And so I think that's the difference between the two. And I think that's why Devin Bush is LB1 on a lot of people's boards. Yeah, I, I'm with you on Devin Bush of uh, not being quite as athletic, obviously, as Devin White. And and it's crazy that they're only three, par- point, three pounds apart because they do not look even remotely close body top mm. type wise. I mean, Devin White looks like he's chiseled out of, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm forgetting my different kinds of, of rock. Of marble, there you go. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> it's been one of those days. You need to go to more to- museums. I do. I do. I really do. But, you know, and, and Devin Bush, just not quite there body type wise. Uh, but I do think he is kind of the, the cleaner prospect. If you're thinking of guy that's going to be ready year one to be a, a huge contributor. I mean, he's coming from a lot more complicated defense there in, in, uh, in Michigan, like compared to what you said, De- Devin White is there at LSU and what he's asked to do on the field and things like that. But it's it's one of those great conversations of what do you go for potential or production? 
not saying that Devin White doesn't have a lot of great production, but Bush, I do think, is that cleaner prospect where the, the, the floor is a lot higher for sure. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those, where does a high floor get you drafted is, is kind of the big question. And and it's not to say that White doesn't have a high floor. It's not to say Bush doesn't have a high ceiling. It's just a preference thing over, do you want the player who's more refined, who's a little bit more likely to be able to go out and, and be a great player from day one? Or do you want a player who you think can be a perennial pro, you know, two years into the future. And it's just a preference. It's also kind of a need. So a team like the Broncos who maybe they can get by with what they have right now while Devin White, you know, goes out and maybe they're not in, in a position to win now, right now, but kind of building the roster, you get a guy like Devin White to go along with whatever young quarterback you eventually add and take time to develop versus, you know, a team that's probably a little bit later in the first round who's looking to go out and try to win a Super Bowl this upcoming year, you might want to go for a guy like Devin Bush. Obviously, White won't be there, but, you know, that's just kind of what the teams are looking for. Or, or, or a team like the Falcons, and not saying the Falcons need a inside linebacker, but just the fact that if they had the choice between the two, maybe they would go for a guy like Bush because even though they're picking high, they're expecting to compete for a championship soon within, you know, this year or next year. Right. Right, exactly. Now, most are thinking that this guy is maybe the the third ranked guy, but he's been really kind of falling, especially there at the end of the season with the the playoffs. Uh, he just kind of fell off. A lot of those Alabama defensive players just I don't know what happened to their defense, but it just kind of crumbled there at the end of the season. But Mac Wilson. Now you were talking earlier about a lot of these guys being great coverage guys, and Mac Wilson. I mean, that's one thing you can say about him. He is great in coverage. Uh, he, he's got the athleticism to, to keep up with anybody. He makes some athletic plays that not many linebackers out there can make. But I, I guess one, let, let's just start with what, what do you think of his fall so far? Is it, do you think it's really well-deserved or is that something that just people are so wrapped up in the last moment that they kind of miss out on all the rest of his tape? Well, the first big thing to look at is Devin White's been starting at LSU for, I want to say two, maybe three years. Um, and the same thing goes for Devin Bush. Mac Wilson didn't – I'm pretty sure Mac Wilson's first career start to a game was in last year's college football playoffs. You know, Alabama's a school that consistently produces NFL players at the linebacker position. We're talking about C.J. Mosley potentially being the highest play, you know, paid linebacker ever was an Alabama alum five years ago. You've got a guy like Ruben Foster two years ago, Reggie Ragland. You know, every single year we're talking about an Alabama linebacker get drafted in the first two or three rounds, and Mac Wilson's no different. But the problem with that is that you're not playing. You don't get those in-game reps. So when you are there, there are going to be times for mental mistakes. Um, in terms of upside, I think Wilson's ceiling is higher than Bush's. Um, I think it, it may even rival White's. I don't recall if he tested at the Combine or or what the testing was. You know, looked like if he did, but... Like you, like I said earlier, um, and, and Wilson was really the main guy I was talking about because Wilson is so dominant in coverage. And and we talk about, well, would you sacrifice a little bit of that run-stuffing ability to be a coverage guy? And I, I think Wilson's not matched in the class. I think his awareness in zone, um, his length, and his natural ability to just line up on a tight end or a running back and, and shut them down is something that we haven't seen, and he might be the best at it in recent memory. I He leaves a little to be – he leaves – you know, some to be desired and the ability to get off blocks um, to kind of just put his nose into the trenches and, and go make a tackle, go get a tackle for loss. But he, he's almost like a second, you know, well, I guess not a second, but, but uh, yeah, another line of defense in the pass coverage, which is something that you just don't see very often from the linebacker position. Yeah. He's got some of the best hips of any linebacker I've seen in a while. He had an interception. I think it was against. LSU where he looked better than most safeties in the NFL level. I mean, the change of direction, the fluidity was great. I do worry about the aggressiveness, I guess, coming downhill. Like you're not going to see him blow up many plays. Like you said, behind the line of scrimmage, but even just arriving to the ball for carrier, it doesn't, he doesn't always arrive with incredible force and he doesn't really bring that, that hit stick, so to speak. And sometimes, I mean, that can be a bad thing for a guy like Devin White, you know, out of control, but I feel like it's almost like a passiveness 
in the run game and coming on and taking on blocks. So there's a concern there. And I just am curious about his overall athletic upside. You know, a guy that didn't test, he looked solidly athletic, but compared to guys like Devin Bush, Devin White, I'm not sure what, what the ceiling is there athletically, but I love the coverage upside. And I think he'll probably end up going the back end of round one. One of those playoff teams will take him. But if he's there at 41, I, I would be very happy to have him in Denver because they need a nickel linebacker. I mean, desperately they need a nickel linebacker. And, and just to give you guys a heads up, he did test in two drills at the combine. He tested in the broad jump and the vertical jump. And, and neither of them were all that special, but I mean, it wasn't anything that was too terrible either. It's just, uh, I don't know, playing against Alabama, playing for Alabama, it's, he's surrounded by elite talent. And, you know, you do have those guys that stood out. There's a little bit of a pedigree there, but you also got to wonder, like, how much is it? You know, stuff is being funneled to him. He's making plays because he's got Quinn and Williams in front of him, just absolutely dominating at the point of attack and getting after the quarterback. So there's a little bit of risk there. I wouldn't feel comfortable taking him top 20 in the draft. But 41, where the Broncos pick second round, I mean, I, I would definitely be excited about that. Yeah, and for there was a, a while where Wilson was one of my favorite picks to mock the Redskins at 15. And this is more towards the earlier, you know, half the first half of the NFL season because there was a pressing need at linebacker. Um, Wilson was still performing well at school, and he'd come off that excellent college football playoffs last year. And, and he was someone I really, you know, enjoyed. And, and like you said, just later into the season, and, and it feels this way with every Alabama player, they just kind of struggled towards the end. And he really was not excellent in that college football playoff game against Oklahoma, and he struggled a, a fair bit against Clemson as well. So he's definitely a guy that I think you get a lot of value from in the second round because his ability to cover is so coveted. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not a team takes him in the first, just because of some of the other question marks. We'll see if he, you know, works out at the pro day, if he runs jumps and does everything that he needs to, to show us that he does have the athleticism to play every down and his coverage isn't just, you know, part of the scheme or part of Alabama's talent. It, it's actually himself. So that's something I'm excited to see for his pro day. But I think Wilson's just overall the coverage ability is is too important to not have him as a highly ranked player. Now speaking about coverage, moving on to a guy who's flashed some athleticism, but kind of in the other end. He's almost the, the anti-Mac Wilson. You know, that athleticism shows out in run support and chasing guys down. But Voshan Joseph from Florida, a guy that also didn't do super great at the NFL Combine, to be honest, so that the SEC East, really, Georgia mainly, but Florida guys didn't do the best either. But Voshan Joseph, I'm curious about your thoughts on him, Matt. Joseph's someone that a lot of people is, are higher on than I am. Uh, I currently have him, I want to say, if I remember correctly, like linebacker eight, seven or eight. It's just a lot of inconsistencies in the game. He, like you said, he does have that athletic ability. It shows on tape. And it shows when he's coveraging that he can keep up with the backs and, and, you know, guys like tight ends. The problem is he's not really – he doesn't do an excellent job of breaking on the ball. He doesn't do a great job of staying with them in the routes. He's kind of just following instead of predicting, which is something that does get you caught out as a linebacker because you become susceptible to double moves, um, to quick routes like a curl, a hitch, a slant, things like these where um, – a good trained, a, a tight end that runs his routes well, or it's going to hit you with a little false step, um, try and shake you off, and, and he bites just about every time. Uh, he does have little inconsistencies with tackling, and he doesn't have he doesn't do a great job of getting off blocks either. So, just as someone that I like the tools a lot, but I just don't see him being ready to play soon. I think it'll take at least a year to kind of get him where he needs to be and, and put those physical traits somewhere where they can succeed. And so I think with a guy like Big Fangio, obviously we have talked about having to get him that talent. Joseph, I think, makes a lot of sense in round three or round four, but round two or above is a little rich for me. What are your thoughts, Carl? Yeah, I mean, it's all these guys. It's such a, a, a raw class. And I think you're starting to see that a lot more in the college game where guys are only getting that one to two years of real production. Uh, this is why I, I was telling somebody earlier about this of Ed Oliver going to a non power five school might've been one of the best things for him because he got that three years of, of true film out there and compared to, you know, Williams from Alabama mm -hmm. getting only this one year and everybody going, yeah, he was dominant, but is this a one year 
production or is this what he's going to be in the future? I, I mean, I think he's going to be an amazing player in, in the NFL, but some of these guys, you just see these inconsistencies that they don't have the time to, to always work out. And, and Joseph, there's things I like, there's times I'm going, wow, that was, that was awesome. And then there's those other times where, like you said, he's biting on things. He's not seeing the field right. I mean, there's even times with Devin White that I saw this where he's running by guys. Uh, he, he's almost too athletic at times where he's getting to the spot too quick and then he overruns the play. And and so some of these guys, it's just uh, – I, I like – most of these guys, part of it is I, I keep thinking of Fangio, so I'm kind of going, well – you get that athleticism paired with such a great coach, he's going to turn him into something. So, I mean, I, I like the guy. I, I really do. But uh, I don't have him. Oh, I'd say he's maybe five or sixth on my list of of linebackers right now in this upcoming draft. Yeah. yeah and and, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. One of the downsides to me is, like we talked about with Mac, is something that – he's so coveted for is that coverage ability. So I think there are just a number of guys in the class who I just prefer the coverage upside and I'm okay with having a little bit of, you know, a lackluster ability to get, you know, their nose into the backs or, you know, downfield. So with, especially with a team like the Broncos that have such great penetrators already on that defense, um, I definitely think that sacrificing a bit in the run game for their ability and pass coverage is okay, and Boshan Joseph is just kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, you're right. There are some limitations there, and you know, for what you saw on tape, you're hoping he'd be a little bit more athletic. Didn't really add up at the combine, but you know, combine isn't everything. But somebody who really impressed me at the combine, and man, talk about that wingspan. His number one comparison, honestly, on uh, mock draftable is. Darius Leonard, another guy with a crazy wingspan, and that is Bobby Okurike of Stanford. A, he did pretty well at the Senior Bowl, a guy I've been a fan of for a bit. I'm not sure where his value exactly lies. I think he's probably more of a late round three, early round four kind of guy, but a guy that I think makes a decent amount of sense. He's a guy that needs to do a little bit better with his instincts as well, but I think there's upsides there as far as pass coverage and just an overall linebacker ability that, I mean, I, I would be very interested in him, in him for the Broncos as a, a compliment to Davis and Jewel. No, to, kind of a different kind of guy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's one well, the biggest part I think of when I see O'Grady is explosive, and that's kind of what it is with the tape, is when he's on and he's making his reads correctly and, and he's doing everything he needs to, he's breaking down the tackles, um, he's not over pursuing. He's an excellent, excellent player. And I think that's where we got some of that kind of first round hype from um, going into the senior bowl. It was a lot of, okay, well this linebacker class is definitely subpar, especially when we thought that Mac Wilson and Devin white might be going back to school. It was like, okay, can Okarike be this kind of savior of the class? And with the profile, the physical abilities, they're there, right? He has the wingspan. He has decent enough size. I would like to see him, you know, put on a little more weight, 234, five-ish is what I think where you measured in that is really, really light at the next level. And it makes you question whether or not he's going to be able to get off blocks, but he did a good job at Stanford. He took on, he understands how to fight off the blocks, which is what's important. It's not necessarily the, you know, the size, but it's the technique and the, the hand fighting and almost like you're rushing a passer, the ability to get off a run block. Um, I don't have any problems with the long speed or the size besides his weight. And so I think he definitely has that kind of mold of a linebacker that you can turn into a good player, someone who you can get in the middle rounds that can still produce at the next level because he has those physical tools. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like the upside there, and he's a guy that I know the Broncos have shown some interest in, you know, kind of that tier three linebacker of this class. That's kind of where we're wading through right now. You know, guys that are borderline top 100 players in the class, maybe top 120. Another one that, you know, I've heard that his medicals did come back positively. He was a very athletic player before his injuries kind of zapped him of that ability. But again, medicals are supposed to you know, clear him. And he did test pretty well at the combine. Uh, Drew Twank, Tranquil of Notre Dame. And I don't know if you're a listener of the the uh, Draft Dudes podcast, but they always talk about how great of a good looker Drew Tranquil is. So I'm always about adding, you know, good looking guys for the football field. I think that's I think that's important to get the uh, all the female fans and 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 our you know male fans that like guys whatever in, <laughs> into there. <laughs> you know, whatever, no judgment. I don't care. But six two two thirty five and a pretty pretty good athlete. And his comparison on mock draftables, Malik Jefferson, obviously not the same athlete, but a guy that. 
again, if you can cover him up a little bit and you're looking for some speed and coverage ability at that second level, I think this guy's got very good sleeper upside. This is my this is my boy here. Ooh, okay. Well, then now now I'm questioning after I talked about how good looking he is and saying all that. <laughs> yeah, now you said that this is my boy. It this doesn't matter. Boy. It doesn't matter. But uh, this. <laughs> questions, girl. Questions. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. No, I, I just I, I like the high athleticism. I, I like what he does in coverage. I think he's a guy that is just beginning to scratch the surface of what he could bring to a team. Uh, I, I, I mean, there, there's some inconsistency in his inconsistency in his game. Obviously, the injuries you got all those kind of question marks with him. But for a mid to late round guy, this is a guy that I, I would definitely take a chance on because I think if if he can stay healthy and and again you pair him with a great coordinator and guy that knows how to use that kind of talent, I think he could be something special. Yeah, and I like Trinkwell. Obviously, that Notre Dame defense had a lot of talent on it this year. Um, so similar with the Alabama questions, we kind of have to go, okay, does he, you know, was he, was playing next to, uh, was playing next to Coney helping, you know, playing, you know, with Julian Love covering, you have a lot of NFL talent on that defense. And I think it shows in Tranquil's ability. He's not super twitchy, which I wish, um, which I like in my linebackers. And that's why I like Devin White um, as LB1 over Bush is just that ability to kind of that instant go somewhere, that instant explosion off. Explosion. Yep. That's the yeah. One. But he's. You know, he's got the long speed to do it. Like you said, he does have the athleticism. Uh, he's not real explosive. He doesn't have a great change, the ability to go from one spot to another. But he's he's physical. He loves to get, you know, his face in. And, and that's what I want to see from a linebacker. So from you know, a potential standpoint, getting a guy like this in, you know, the fourth, fifth, sixth round is definitely something that can work. It's someone who you can have played because – even though he might never reach an all pro pro bowl level ceiling, he is someone that has that kind of low floor or that, that high floor low ceiling where it's okay. Even though we, you know, we're drafting him, not expecting him to be a pro bowler, having an average linebacker who gives you good snaps and plays good enough football that works. That's something that you want from a fifth round big that's considered a hit. And so that's definitely something that I think Trinquil can be. Um, the medicals, obviously, like you said, need to check out, and and there are limitations. He'll, I, I don't think he'll ever be a uh, 120 tackle, you know, three interceptions, three forced fumbles kind of linebacker. But you know, 80, 90, 100 tackles. I don't, I don't see why not, especially with a team like the Broncos, like we've talked about all day, with that that ability to, you know, kind of get behind Miller you know, the guys like that Chubb and just be able to clean up what they can't get done. Right. And, and that's, that's for me. I, I think he's just a value signing for me. If you're going to miss out on the Devin whites and the Devin bushes of, of this draft, if you can go get a guy in that fourth round that can still be a productive player for you, that that's a huge win in the draft. Yeah, absolutely. He'd be a good one to get, you know, round four, round five, you know, the medicals came back clean apparently. So we will see, but I am a, I'm a big fan of him and let's just, you know, use this time since we only have a limited, limited amount of time. We're not going to spend too much time on the Tavion Coney. He is probably not a fit for the Broncos. Uh, Conley, excuse me, not a fit for the Broncos, more of that thumper. If he was playing in the league, you know, 20 years ago, he probably would have been a pretty high draft pick, but you know, that's not the league today. So Moving along now, the linebacker that the Broncos actually have been linked to a heck of a lot, Jermaine Pratt from North Carolina State. He's a former safety, a little bit rigid in the hips, but he's he does okay in the, the coverage still despite that rigidity. And he's also the the captain of their or was the captain of that North Carolina State Wolfpack defense, taking it from former Broncos first round pick, Bradley Chubb. And I know that you have some takes on him as well, Matt. <laughs> um, first take, I did not know rigidity was a word. And oh yes, man. That's I'm, yeah, that's a cellular that is, biology word. That cellular is, biology. Yeah. You're talking about the cell wall, kind of especially the plant cells. Yeah, science getting yeah. put into my vocabulary. One hundred percent. Glad to know. Um, but yeah, I actually like Jermaine Pratt a fair bit. I have him as my linebacker for. And for those of you who don't know, um, I have a bet with Joe Marino um, on how high. Pratt gets taken. I had Pratt in a mock get taken, like, I want to say 31st or 29th. It was one of those two. I had the Rams taking Pratt um, in the late, late first round. And he questioned it. He was like, wow, Pratt in the first is a hot take. Meanwhile, at this time, he had Jawan Taylor going ninth overall, which I thought was ridiculous because I'm not as high on Taylor as some others. I really just don't think Taylor can be a left tackle. But 
besides the point. So I have a bet that Jermaine Pratt will go closer to like 31 than Jawan Taylor will go to nine. Um, so I'm really hoping, and I think the Broncos could be a team like that to take Pratt in the top 10 because the, the, the athletic ability is there. It shows on tape. He's an excellent, excellent athlete. I do have some questions as to his, his ability to read. He's kind of, to me, like a poor man's Devin White. Um, not as explosive an athlete, a little bit bigger, which I like. Um, I do prefer linebackers that have a good amount of size, 6'3", 245. He should be able to cover theoretically with his length and size and speed, but he doesn't flip the hips real well. He he does a poor job of feeling the routes, kind of where someone's going to go. But I think what he did for NC State was, you know, he, he played really great football this year. Shooting the gaps versus the run, he did an excellent job of, I thought. And, and I didn't have a lot of red flags, just a couple of things that I think he could improve on. And I think with his athletic profile and with his size, he could. I, I definitely like him. I mean, he's a guy I do think, at least media-wise, has been climbing up boards quite a bit. The more people have got a chance to watch him. I mean, that, that always happens where the the big school guys, White, Bush, Wilson, they're always going to get the attention at, at the beginning. But as the offseason wears on, you're going to definitely be hearing more and more about Pratt. I, I definitely think he could be that second round kind of guy. Uh, I, I don't know about late first round. We'll, we'll kind of see on that one. That, that's a that's a pretty hot take to me too. Uh, I haven't seen him quite that high on anybody else's thoughts, but uh, he, he's a very talented player. And again, just a, a guy that fits well with what the Broncos are looking for of an athletic guy that can, can go make some plays for you and, and can be a, maybe a, a true three down line, linebacker for you. I, don't like him as much as some of the other guys, but I, I think he has a pretty high floor too. I think that's something that I do really appreciate appreciate about him is I think he's going to become a, a pretty quality starter in the NFL for whoever he goes to. I don't think he's ever going to reach that high ceiling of a Devin White or Devin Bush or anything like that, but I think he's going to be a guy that you plug and play and, and you're pretty happy about it. Yeah. Absolutely, and he's one that the Broncos have been linked to multiple times, so look out for him. All right, and now we got a a few guys left to talk about here. We won't spend as long. You know, kind of start to get down to these later guys, and you haven't done as much work on them. The cut-ups aren't as readily available, but a guy that stood out a lot at the Senior Bowl and had a disappointing combine because he had an injury, but Terrell Hanks from New Mexico State. I wrote down North Carolina State. Excuse me, New Mexico State. And a, a guy, another one that, you know, former safety, very fluid mover, there's some questions about his ability to take on blockers the next level, you know, play in that second level of the defense with the physicality needed on a three, four defense, how many blockers are going to take on. But as a guy that I'm, I'm eager to see how he runs at his, his pro day. Cause he apparently, you know, tweaked the hammy. So he's not going to run that five forty because if he did, you know, launch him into the sun, he's not being drafted, but a guy that I'm really excited to see, hopefully will play a little bit better at the, at his pro day, you know, run a little better at his pro day, but really stood out at the, the senior bowl looked fluid in coverage. And we had, again, I was edited the podcast. I wasn't on there, but Andre Simone on here said that, well, he thought Terrell Hanks looked better at the senior bowl than Darius Leonard did last year. Now, granted the senior bowl is going to highlight guys that are a little bit more fluid in coverage. And that's not exactly, you know, Darius Leonard's game, but Terrell Hanks, I think a, a sleeper pick for the Broncos as far as a coverage linebacker goes. Yeah. And this is someone I've actually done a ton of research on um, UTEP and NMSU players are people I'm always um, early on and and always really high on. And the reason is, Nick, you know, you growing up kind of an Iowa fan, you being in the area. I grew up in El Paso, Texas, um, where the University of Texas at El Paso UTEP is. And then when I was about nine years old, I moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is about 20 minutes away. And that's where NMSU is. I have a ton of friends that go to NMSU. My dad's an alumni. Um, So NMSU, someone, and Hanks is actually someone I've met a couple times. And he's a really great dude. Um, but the athleticism really screams. And I think if Hanks go- is going to a different school, if Terrell's going to a different school, you know, a, a power five school, a school where he can get an actual linebackers coach, a school where he's put in the scheme to succeed. We're talking about him as one of the best linebacker prospects in this draft class. Um, a lot of the problems I see on tape are a lack of technique um, are not knowing what to do because I just don't think he's gotten the proper coaching for it. So I think getting him, especially especially like we've talked about Vic Fangio being argued, you know, the best linebacker coach ever, getting a guy with this natural athletic ability, you know, uh, you know, 
an explosive kind of player with a, a huge motor. And that's what you always want to see is just a linebacker always getting after the ball, getting after the ball. He's got the range. I think he's solid in coverage. Obviously at NMSU, he's not playing big time players. He's not going against top tier athletes, but against the senior bowl, he was. So I think once he kind of gets the coaching that he needs, the ability to get off blocks, the ability to break down and wrap up, um, the ability to process routes just a little bit better, which I think he does a good job of anyways. Um, you know, coming from a safety background is, you know, once he can get all that kind of down, I think we're talking about an elite linebacker prospect, someone with the great athleticism and the good enough size, you know, the 6'2", 235. So I, I think Hanks' upside is a lot better than people give me credit for. So I think, in my opinion, he should be a guy that's going in day two who you can kind of get a steal for in day three. Yeah. He's one that I like a lot. And again, a lot's going to come down to those pro day numbers because he ran a, a sub or no, a, what's the word over five forty. So mm-hmm. you can't have that <laughs> at the next level. And his, his calling card is his speed and fluidity and coverage ability. So obviously yeah, I, there's, there's something going on there. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think any team actually believes that he's that slow by any means. I yeah. think his is a true injury. I, there were some other guys that tried to play that card of, Oh, hmm. tweak to hammy. And oh, I know. Really yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he, he's one of those guys. It's easy to see. All these teams got a chance to see him at the Senior Bowl, see that athleticism, that the fluidity, all those kind of things. So I don't. I mean, I the numbers will matter, but I think they know that there's more to the number than than what he showed there at the at the combine. I absolutely agree. So he's one that I'm very interested in day three for the Broncos. And I, there are some more guys here we want to get to. We're running a little long. Uh, Trey Watson is one that I know, Matt, he said he has seen some on. I know the Broncos met him at the, the Shrine Bowl. And while Watson isn't a great athlete overall, his coverage instincts are great. I believe he had a bunch of uh, pass breakups this past season, along with five interceptions, which for a linebacker, that's that's pretty darn good. Yeah, he, he shows high intelligence on the field in coverage, which I think is really weird. Um, but sometimes I have questions on, on how he reads his keys. Um, I don't think he's an excellent at an athlete. A lot of the tackles he got were kind of just things that were washed to him. Um, Maryland in general, I don't think did him any favors in the scheme they put. It's a very awkward scheme. And I think that's part of the reason he got so many interceptions is he was put in a position to make plays on the ball. It's just parts of the fields that I just don't understand why a linebacker was there. He's playing 15 yards off the ball at times. So Maryland does do some weird stuff with their defensive. They almost, so it, it, the way, at least how I perceived it on the film, there was a lot of times where Watson was playing over top and um, Savage was playing underneath. And it was just a really weird coverage to see. And it's not something he'll be asked to do much in the NFL. But, you know, a, a flyer pick in, in sixth or seventh rounds with that high coverage upside is something that every team could use. You know, especially, you know, the Broncos, we talked about having Jewel and Davis um, kind of being those thumpers, but not knowing what to do. Watson kind of helps alleviate. Maybe he's just playing that dime back role as a rookie. Maybe he's just on the field in obvious passing down. So that's kind of a way to get him uh, situated for the next, you know, you know, as he gets used to the NFL game. Absolutely, but he's definitely one the Broncos have been interested in. Another guy that I want to bring up from the Shrine Bowl that the Broncos have met with multiple times, and I've been impressed watching him. I think the upside is intriguing, to say the least. He's a guy, he played actually defensive end his junior year, and then he was moved to off-ball linebacker this past year, and he actually moved surprisingly well. He actually tested well as well, and that's Simone Takitaki from BYU. I'm curious, have you how much work have you done with him, and what are your impressions of his play? Um, it hasn't been extensive, but I have talked to my coach Dalton, who's actually done a lot. He went to he was on BYU's their like regional program. Okay, and I mean I've done enough. Uh, I watched him. Uh, was it the Shrine Game or the Senior Bowl? Shrine Game. Uh, yeah, where he he performed. He was one. Of, I mean, he was one of the better players on the field at the time. He had the ability to go sideline to sideline. I, I don't. I haven't gotten into a true film assessment. BYU's film isn't necessarily the best cut ups in the world, but. You know, from a height, weight, speed standpoint, he has the tools to be an NFL player. Uh, I think if he's going to make any real noise early, it's going to be on uh, special teams because he does have a nose for getting after the football. Um, he is easy to see with the hair, so that's kind of fun. But uh, at the end of the day, I think he's another one of those guys where it's just a prospect, um, someone you kind of get in with, you know, not with the ex- expectation that he's going to be great and the expectation he's going to be an excellent player. Um, but kind of someone you bring in to challenge for roster spots 
and, and has some upside to be an average every down player. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. And I think that another thing about him that, again, we talked about with Devin White, is that he, because he's a def- he was a defensive end, he absolutely just dominates as a blitzer. Like, he could shoot through the gap, and he's very powerful in that regard. And he, can, he has no problem taking on blockers. So he's a very interesting player, and I know the Broncos really like to get those guys, especially day three, that played at altitude already, whether it be Utah, BYU, Colorado, Colorado State, et cetera. You know, scout those areas. So Son Takitaki Taki is a guy that I'm very interested in for the Broncos. Um, some other names here kind of want to point out, just give you a, a dealer's choice here, Matthew. Um, we got Khalil Hodge, Ben Burkirvan, uh Khalil Hodge from Buffalo, Ben Burkirvan from Washington, Kendall Joseph from Clemson, and uh, Trey, Trey Lamar from Clemson. Any of those guys stand out to you as far as a, a potential, maybe a potential one-day three-down linebacker with some coverage ability? Um, other than that group, my favorite's probably Ben Burkirvan. Um, ben Burkirvan, uh, someone who I like a lot, a little undersized, you know, six foot two twenty, almost plays like a, a dime linebacker anyways. But at Washington, he showed a, a great ability to kind of diagnose what tight ends running backs were going to do earlier. Um, and he did it better than a lot of people in the class. I actually like Burke Irvin a lot in day two. Um, I think he's great value. If you can get him in, in that kind of third round spot, my apologies. He has a weird fit in the 3-4, and that's kind of my biggest issue. Luckily, teams don't. I, I don't know about the Broncos, but like the Redskins are in a pure 3-4 no team really is. Less than, yeah, less you know, than it's 20%. like versatile fronts and the exactly. coverages you run. It's diff- yeah, essentially, different. yeah, exactly. Um, nickel is pretty much a base for every team now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think Burkirvan fits into that. But in terms of not fitting into the base, defense does have some questions. I think he might just get changed to safety. Um, he obviously doesn't have excellent speed, but not a lot of safeties do anymore. You see guys like um, Andrew Sandejo, even Lanny Collins was an excellent athlete. And, and I'm not saying Brooke Irvin's ever going to be on that level, but the ability to cover well enough um, and still make plays in the run game. Um, I like Brooke Irvin a lot and I like the value and where I think you can get him versus where I think he should be going. Yeah, for sure. And out of these guys, for me, I really like Kendall Joseph. I mean, I don't really like Kendall Joseph, but as far as the linebackers go at Clemson, I man, I was really hoping Isaiah Simmons would come out, but unfortunately, oh my gosh, uh, he's that, a freak. Yeah. next year, man, next year, that's the dude. <laughs> he could be linebacker one next year. He's they're listing him at safety, but he's you know he's a box safety linebacker. He's that hybrid guy, that linebacker that just those I just guys wish have we had next year's class already. I know. I'm already – A.J. Epinesa, man. I'm, I'm already – Broncos don't need edge rusher, but I'm just going to say his name until it happens. Grant, Grant Delpit and Landon Collins next to each other would be a dream come true. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Delpit. Oh, my gosh. Delpit would be defensive back one if he was in this class easily. Oh, yeah, for sure. I freak. think Del- going into next year, Delpit is probably my player one. Man, I got uh, – I guess with uh, if you don't use uh, – if you don't put positional weights on it, mm-hmm. it's up there. But Chase Young and AJ Epinesa are freaking freaks, and AJ Epinesa is going to test like an, an absolute psychopath, six five, two eighty, and he's going to run and jump like a maniac. I'm so excited. I'm going to hopefully talk to him at the Iowa Pro Day, but we'll see. Um, but some other guys coming up here uh, that you know we haven't done as much work on, but they're worth highlighting here. Ty Summers from Texas Christian tested very well. Cody Barton from Utah, kind of smaller, but a very intelligent guy, and heard that. Vic Fangio took a liking to at the combine, so we'll see there. Tavi from Hawaii, he's a guy who kind of moves around, kind of that Kyle Venois. Not obviously not the athlete there, but kind of a just a jack of all trades kind of guy. And then Blake Cashman from Minnesota, who really fun player, good at getting downhill, can you know he's, he's so slippery. But oh my gosh, if he doesn't have the smallest arms of any player mm. ever, like he he's literally I made fun of Chris Borland when he came out calling him a T Rex <clears throat> and saying that those arms might be an issue get off blocks and you know he uses the intelligence the balance the quickness to get off of it but like he has the smallest arm like he's in like the second and first percentile for arm length and oh, wingspan he, like he's a T Rex yeah well he's getting a lot of hype though coming out of the combine. yeah it's it really I mean the arm length is just kind of a funny thing to point out it really comes down to the medicals which is true for a lot of people I guess. All right, well, looking at this list, you know, let's say, you know, obviously Devin White, Devin Bush are the guys, but if there's one of these second tier, third tier, you know, day two, day three kind of guys that you'd peg as, you know, a guy that you would put your brand on as a guy that's going to stand out and break the mold, be this year's Darius Leonard of sorts, or maybe even, well, you won't even put that much of a praise on him. This year's, uh, oh gosh, who was the guy from BYU last year? Fred Young. No. 
Yeah, Fred Warner. Fred Warner, sorry. Fred Warner. Yep, no, you're close. The W-Y is close enough. This year's Fred Warner. Who's going to be this year's standout guy that goes late and then really makes an impact? Um, I like Hanks a lot, um, but my guess would probably be Burt Kirvin. Um, just the value he brings, I think he'll instantly become a team's number one dimebacker, um, where even if he's not making the plays in the run game, you take both of your starting, especially if you're in a 3-4, both of your starting linebackers come off the field, Brickervin goes in, and you're essentially running a, a seven defensive back unit you know, with a guy who's 230. Yeah, good call. All right, well, Carl, you have any anything you want to say before we wrap up and close out? Well, I'll just say my guy, I'm going to stick with him. He's my boy, Drew Tranquil of, of, of Notre Dame. So I'm nice. going to keep pounding that table. I know that shouldn't surprise anybody, but <laughs> I'll, I'll pound that table for him being that, that mid-round guy late round guy that uh, that could really come in be a high end back guy rookie year and i think he's i think he's smart i, I think he's obviously got the athleticism to do pretty well and he's he's definitely a guy that he just shows a lot of energy on the field so he, he's my guy that if the broncos get him i'm i'm definitely going to be uh, doing a, a fist pump at at the excitement of getting him and i know i'm going to go out on a limb here but if Devin White falls to day three, I'd be very happy with him. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> oh, man. Forgot about that guy. Yeah, he just needs to come to visit Denver and, you know, random car search. And, uh, hey, your buddy had weed in the car. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> oh, okay, just kidding. Moving along. All right, well, that's going to wrap up today's episode of Building the Broncos, powered by Overtime Media. You can find Carl on Twitter, on Twitter at Carl Dumbler, MHH and myself at Nick Kendall, MHH. Make sure you follow Matt at MV Scouting and check out his work at Blue Chip Scouting and his podcast also called Blue Chip Scouting. It's on iTunes. You can subscribe. I listen to it. It's a good time. It's fun, funny to listen to Dalton get on his rants. Hopefully we'll get him on, on here sometime as well. Make sure you head on over to Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of 24-7 Sports and CBS Sports Digital to find more content covering the Denver Broncos. Head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and comment. Your support can help us continue to bring you our Denver Bronco deep dives. You can follow the Building the Broncos podcast and all our other great audio content by subscribing to the Huddle Up podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter, at Mile High Huddle and at BTB Football Pod. For Carl and Matt, I'm Nick wrapping up another episode of the Building the Broncos podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you soon. Go Broncos! You've been listening to Building the Broncos. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.